So my in my practice, um, I'm very aware of how food um, contributes to mental health symptoms. I'm very aware of inflammatory foods and helping people figure out which foods are inflaming them and which might be inflaming their brains. I'm very aware of this issue of blood sugar stability and the fact that many people with mental health conditions have blood sugar that goes up and down, leading to depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, brain fog, all kinds of things. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you, your loved ones, or clients suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health practitioners from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal. If you like this interview, please do subscribe and forward to others who might find it helpful. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. So Josh Friedman, welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. Really happy to have you. So glad um, to be here. Really excited because Josh, I'm, I'm so excited because you're my first psychotherapist who was into integrative mental health. And so, you know, I'm really excited to talk to you because I think you combine the best of psychology, psychotherapy, and then the biochemical approach. So I'm really happy to talk to you. I just will give a little bit of background about your biog, and then I'll put the rest in the show notes. So Dr. Friedman earned his doctorate in psychology from New York University and received postdoctoral training in psychoanalysis for the Training and Research Institute for Self Psychology in New York City. You worked as an eating disorders psychotherapist at the esteemed Renfrew Center of New York, and we know that eating disorders is quite a tricky area. And you're on the faculty of the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. For more than 10 years, you've worked as a psychologist with adults, couples, and families. Your practice has evolved, and it's become very clear to you that something was missing from traditional psychotherapeutic approaches. And curiosity in a chance meeting, which hopefully you'll tell us about, led you to discover the world of nutritional psychology, which teaches many psychological issues are caused or made worse by underlying biochemical nutritional deficiencies. Further explanation led you to the practice of yoga with its emphasis on breathing, meditation, and movement for emotional centering. And you're married to a lovely yoga teacher who's fantastic. To enhance your effectiveness in helping patients to heal and grow, you became certified as a holistic health counselor at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition in New York. And to go deeper into the hidden physical causes of mental health symptoms, you've studied with nutritional mental health leaders such as Dr. William Walsh and Julia Ross. Additionally, you've become a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, and you're close to becoming a certified functional medicine practitioner through the Functional Medicine University. You have a practice in Omaha and Nebraska, which offers integrative psychotherapy services and combines the healing power of insight-oriented psychotherapy with education about lifestyle and nutritional tools that have shown scientific efficacy in improving mental health symptoms. And you have a telehealth business called Alternative Mental Health Solutions. So uh, basically you are just an incredibly accomplished doctor in many, many ways. And what I'd love to do is to find out a little bit from you personally about your journey. What made you gravitate towards the biochemistry, having done sort of the more traditional psychology and psychotherapeutic training? It sort of goes back to that chance meeting. So the I did, I did um, seven years of grad school in psychology with a fo uh, focus on, on psychoanalysis, which was uh, amazing. And it was about the healing power of the relationship. It was about understanding past dynamics and trauma. And I ended up learning just how to be with patients and heal in a healing way. So I, um, like right as I was ending grad school, my wife at the time was having some hormonal problems. And so she met with someone that was called a biochemical nutritionist. And that was the first time I'd heard that term. It was pre, it was a chiropractor trained in nutrition, like pre-functional medicine. And he did some diagnostic testing. And at the time I thought it was like pretty outside the box. I was sort of mainstream. 
Um, and over time with dietary changes, some supplementation, her moods just kind of settled and her moods had been very like labile and up and down. And I was like, Hmm, this is something. So she was a writer and was going to write a book about this guy and his practice. And we went out to dinner with him and he said something to me that sort of changed everything. He said, do you know why your anorexic patients don't get better? And I said, mm, trauma, um, because they have anorexia. I, I didn't have a good answer. And he said, because they're protein malnourished. And I said, protein malnourished. He said, do you know the only, you, you know about serotonin, right? And I said, yeah. He said, you've been told that, that eating disorders are somehow linked to serotonin. I was like, yeah. He said, do you know where serotonin comes from? And I said, no. And he said, the only thing in the world that can become serotonin is an amino acid which is a breakdown product of protein called tryptophan. And if you don't eat protein and you don't break protein down, you can't make serotonin. And so that, that like one phrase, like I heard that, like there was lots of things I didn't hear because my lens didn't permit me to hear it, but I heard that. And he said, let me give you a book that will explain all of this a little bit more. And so he handed me the book by Julia Ross called The Mood Cure. And Julia Ross, um, who I hadn't heard of, of course, Julia Ross was a master's level therapist in California working with addictions, eating disorders, and trauma. And she was bumping her head against the wall with these clients and realized there has to be something more. So she started looking into this field called amino acid therapy. So it's giving targeted amino acids like tryptophan and tyrosine and GABA and some others. They're the building blocks of the mood centers of the brain of the neurotransmitters. And she turned to a man named Kenneth Blum. And Kenneth Blum is a very, was kind of a fringy researcher that was looking at the use of amino acids for the treatment of addictions. And he, wasn't having a very, it wasn't having very good luck to find clinicians who were willing to use these tools in clinical practice to do research. Um, and he found Julia Ross. And so Julia Ross created this book and it came out, I think in the nineties that lays out a nutritional medicine approach, food-based approach, supplement-based approach um, to mental health conditions. And so I felt like I had both x-ray glasses and the, like sort of the Bible. Like I felt like everything was in this book that I needed to know. Um, and I brought it back to Renfrew where I was working at the time. And I was like, I met this, I, I met this amazing person. I know some things now I didn't know before. And the therapy at Renfrew was amazing. There were, it was an integrative treatment program. There were great psychiatrists and dietitians and dance therapists and yoga therapists and we did wonderful groups, but they weren't interested. Like they had no interest whatsoever. And so I said it again, like, do you, do you know why our eating disorder patients aren't getting better? And I told them the whole story about amino acids and protein deficiency and poor digestion. And they said like blank stares. And these are like super educated, skilled psychiatrists with 20 years experience working with eating disorders open-minded clinicians. And that day I got something I got like, Oh, they're like, we can be blinded by our training. Mm -hmm. And so from that day on, and of course, then I went, I had my own earlier history with um, mental health issues from like high school, like um, from high school for many years through grad school. So I started using some of the amino acids and essential fatty acids and I noticed improvements in my, in my anxiety and my depression. So, um, and then my daughter, so it's a, this confluence of things that sort of set this up for me. My daughter was born with like a very serious uh, birth defect that led to massive complications um, and a long medical journey. And so we started, we, um, we were, we had some money. So we were living in New York and we started visiting 
many, many, many different alternative medicine practitioners. So our, our little infant had acupuncture and she went to see a, um, a holistic, um, uh, holistic pediatrician um, named Larry Pilevsky. And then we went to see Dr. Leo Gallant and sort of like some of these people. And we, I started traveling through these functional medicine, integrative medicine circles without actually realizing I was doing it because we were, we were looking to save our kid's life. And so it all sort of like, like found a place in me. And so since that time, so my daughter's now going to college. So this is it's like 20 years, like little by little by little, I've been growing my knowledge base and like, just like, and it's a very, as you know, it's like an incredibly complex field. Um, and it's especially complex if you're coming to it as a poet rather than a scientist. So I, I, I was a therapist interested in the poetics of healing, interested in relatedness, interested in spirituality, interested in breath work and movement. And um, learning biochemistry was a, has been a, a kind of heavy lift. Um, but I've stayed with it like little by little by little. And I, I feel like I've learned, like you learn a piece and then you work with people with it. So my, in my practice, um, I'm very aware of how food um, contributes to mental health symptoms. I'm very aware of inflammatory foods and helping people figure out which foods are inflaming them and which might be inflaming their brains. I'm very aware of this issue of blood sugar stability and the fact that many people with mental health conditions have blood sugar that goes up and down leading to depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, brain fog, all kinds of things. And so I would tell people um, that I mostly focus on low hanging fruit, you know, and there's a lot that can be done, especially functional medicine um, is the science of going down rabbit holes. So there are people interested in mold mycotoxins, super important, of course, you know, debilitating, horrible, can lead to terrible symptoms. But um, that's, it's like a very small arcane field and then heavy metal toxicity. And there are lots of things to learn and it becomes, to learn all of those becomes very difficult. So I, I tend to think of myself as like a first responder. So people come to me and I have, I have pretty broad training. So I have a lot of training in psychoanalysis. I have training in some trauma therapy and EMDR. I do energy tapping. I do, um, I know, a, I've lived with a very accomplished yoga teacher for many years and have done yoga teacher training. So I, I know hundreds of tools to introduce yoga tools, breath work tools, meditation tools, visualization tools. But uh, I think I'm good at looking at the different levels at which people are affected and like saying, hey, here's what I think might be going on. Let's start with the basic stuff. Let's start with giving up foods that are known to be inflammatory. And then, and meeting people where they're at. Like if you tell someone they have to give to a, a, a very sophisticated elimination diet and they start to freeze, I'm like, okay, let's, I use my therapeutic skills and I say, let's back that up. How would you feel about giving up gluten for two weeks and just seeing what happens? And so, and just walking people through, that's probably a longer answer than you were uh, hoping for. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. It gives me a uh, fantastic overview. I mean, I think that's fascinating because that's one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you because I think you have such a privileged overview that so few people have. And as you say, I think part of the problem is that mental health even in the functional medicine realm, tends to be siloed to an extent. Yes. And so people either are sort of experts in mold and mycotoxins or they're experts in nutrition or they're experts in psychotherapy or trauma. But really pulling it all together is super important because at the end of the day, what we do is personalized medicine. And so yes. you have the patient opposite you and then you respond 
And you have this amazing toolbox of ways mm -hmm. to respond to them, whether they're biochemical or whether they're psychological or therapeutic. You have all these tools to help people's mental health. And so what I'd love to ask you, Josh, is when somebody comes in to see you, like what is your... Do you do sort of an intake and then say, okay, based on their symptoms, they need psychotherapy or they might need nutrition help? I mean, how do you decide and then mm -hmm. customize what you think people need? What's your process? So it's sort of interesting because I have several businesses and I have referrals that come in different ways. So some people will come in like as a psychotherapy referral um, and I will, my intake, my intake is very integrative. So it's asking both about trauma kinds of things. And it's also, it's asking about history, like what's your psychological history, but it's also very targeted to sort of specific questions about underlying biochemical issues. So the first thing I assess is what, what do they say about the intake? Like, what are they curious about, about the intake? So I want to meet people right where they're at. So the, um, there are people that come to see me for talk therapy that I'll never mention nutrition to at all. And it may not be because they don't need it. Because I think actually, I mean, I, I think none, the diet, the standard American diet or the standard diet that we eat in the Western countries is ill-equipped for balanced brains and bodies. So I think anyone that comes to see us needs it. <laughs> you know, everyone needs a tweak. And, um, so it, I start where people, I start where people are at. Um, and so if I have a psychotherapy patient and they're pretty clear that they're not interested in nutrition, they're not interested in supplements, um, I will notice things and just pocket them for later. And sometimes later comes. So a typical scenario would be someone who comes, I might see them for a couple of months, focusing on the relationship, like building the rapport, creating in psychoanalysis, what they call the holding environment, which is the frame by which we contain the relationship in. Um, and then I might say, I noticed this, this, and this symptoms. I've noticed that you're having problems sleeping, you're, you're agitated, especially at night, you have a hard time settling, you have racing thoughts. I have some sort of, um, I have a subspecialty in nutritional mental health. Would you be interested in hearing about some things that, that might be helpful? So that person you just described, I would say, and I, and I will often know from like the first moment I meet them because there are very distinct patterns of amino acid deficiencies or neurotransmitter deficiencies. I would say that person has blood sugar issues, low serotonin. And I would say, if I gave you a couple of supplements, what would that feel like? Um, would you be interested? Um, if I suggested some dietary changes or keeping a food diary, would you be interested? And if they say, yeah, I want to do anything that would be helpful, I'm like, great. And I'll start them off. How quickly do you want to do? Do you want to take on three? I'll say, are you the kind of person that wants to read the book? Or do you want, do you want to, do you want to watch a three minute video summary of the book? <laughs> How much can you digest? And I use that summary. I use that since I've worked with eating disorders a lot. I think about digestion a lot, both about how we digest food but more, how do you digest ideas? How do you digest relationships? How does change work with you and move through you? Um, so, but I am thinking a lot about the difference when I see someone in that first meeting or two, where are the imbalances? Mm -hmm. where, where do I think the imbalances are? Um, is this, so I, I've been trained in two different neurofeedback systems too. So is the, are the imbalances electrical? Like, are there electrical imbalances going on in this person? Is there trauma that's, are they stuck in trauma, like a trauma loop? You know, are there problems with their digestion? Like, is there something biochemical? Um, and then the question is, okay, how do I, how do you move with that? And so 
let's say I assume I have a hypothesis that there's digestive problems, you know, there's bloating, there, there's constipation, diarrhea, you know, there are, um, they're sensitive to many foods. The question is, do we address that symptomatically using a target supplement? Let's say a, a spore-based probiotic, you know, and some digestive, digestive enzymes, like some support, or then do we move to some testing? So then it's assessing, are these people, when do they have the means? Are they interested in digging a little deeper? Do they want to order a GI maps test or something? So say, let's like, and I explain, and then explain, and explain doing a lot of education. And I never push things along. I say, I think this might be good now. Let's try it on. How about I give you a link that describes what this is? And I want you to come back to me because we're partnering here. Like this is a partnership. This is not, the, the model is no longer me fixing you. You know, you are not helpless. You, it's the idea is empowering you to take ownership of your health care, of your mental health care. And um, so that's sort of, does that answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's absolutely brilliant. And in terms of what you see the most of, so when people come to you with, you know, their, their issues, whether it's anxiety or depression, or they're having problems in their life, do you feel that there are any patterns in terms of what might be causing these issues? And, you know, we, we talk about the fact that, well, you know, we don't really know what causes depression or anxiety, but as a practitioner, given your breadth of experience yeah. and tools, are there things that come up that you would say, okay, the most frequent causes of people's mental health issues are, you know, X or Y? Yeah. Like, so from my, so from my experience, um, like at a, and there's different levels to that question, I think, I think there's a huge epidemic and, and this is where I focus like this. And so I see things through the, through, I see things a lot through Julia Ross's amino acid work. Um, I think Sarah, that adrenal, uh, adrenal exhaustion, adrenal imbalances and serotonin deficiencies are huge. Um, I think the, by far the most common, like seeing people that are wired but tired and seeing and overly stressed and seeing people that are um, both anxious and depressed and they have a particular kind of edgy or anxious depression. Um, and I think underlying that is um, how out of how overworked and stressed out we are as humans. I think we've lost the ability to live in sync with our with our natural rhythms, with the natural rhythms of the earth. And I think that we uh, have been trained to not listen to our own needs in so many ways. And I think the results ends up with people being incredibly imbalanced. Mm -hmm. um, that have, you've heard of Ayurveda, the sister science to yoga. Um, there, what they say is that, Ill, uh, that the first sign of illness is a break from nature. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not, it makes a lot of sense right now that there's, there's a huge, that where we are right now culturally in the world, in the West especially, is a movement towards uh, nature and a movement towards native cultures and um, plant medicines and connection to the connection to the sea and the forest. Because I think we all know, like in our hearts, that we are completely and totally disconnected with our true selves. Um, and so I think it is a psycho-spiritual crisis we find ourselves in. And of course, serotonin imbalances, adrenal imbalances, digestive imbalances are all way upstream. The basic trauma is, um, is this break from our own nature, our break from being rooted on this earth. And, and over you know generations now, we get farther and farther away. We're living in these artificial environments in, in almost every way. 
And like, it's like, that's like a basic truth, like the deep, like such a deep basic truth. There's this beautiful book. Um, there's a there's a book called it's by Sh- it's Shambhala Press. My name is Chellis, and I'm in recovery from Western civilization. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's this woman who tells this story about um, comparing her own experience of child sexual abuse to the how we how we as people got divorced from the land over time. So she thinks that the beginning of crisis in a health crisis, mental health crisis, was the beginning of farming. So when people were nomadic, there were, there were no possessions. I mean, people, tribes traveled together with no possessions. It's only when you could stay put that there was accumulation of wealth. So there were there the haves and the have-nots, um, the kinds of foods we were eating. But she brings everything back to this being divorced from our animal nature. And she does it in the most, it's like, it's a book from the, I think the 80s, 70s or 80s. And it, I read it on vacation a couple of years ago and I read it to my wife and we were like, this, this is exactly what's happening right now, like 50 years later. It's so interesting because, you know, when you talk about being divorced from nature and being divorced from the land, and we're also divorced from our circadian rhythms because of, you know, exactly the fact right. that we're constantly on and we're on technology and we have light bulbs, etc. But we're also divorced from our bodies. And, you know, one of the key tenets of trauma is dissociation from our bodies. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we no longer inhabit our bodies and whether it's because because we're sort of our lifestyles or whether it's because we've had trauma there's a real disconnect between ourselves our circadian rhythms our natural environments and our bodies and it's really interesting that you you know and then the downstream effect of that is the adrenal burnout and the lack of serotonin and in some ways, those are biochemical yes. reactions to Agreed. the stressors and the traumas that we are experience through our lifestyle and through our circumstances. Mm-hmm. And so do you find that when you treat people, I mean, how do you address that as a therapist, but also as somebody who works with the biochemistry, you know, in these cases of adrenal burnout and these cases of serotonin deficiency and these cases of disconnect from circadian rhythms. I mean, what are your sort of go-to ways of dealing with this to try and get people better? And do people get better? Are you able to improve people? Uh, Hopefully. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's interesting. So my first training was in psychoanalysis. And so psychoanalysis really focuses on on, on regulation and co-regulation. And so I'm... I, the, the first skill I have as a, as a healer person is attunement. And so all of these ideas, and of course, uh, uh, as we know about attachment theory, this idea that we are always tuning to one another and, and we are always regulating one another. And so I think that my starting point is to be present and is to help people be present. And, and be, so my, uh, the, my interest in psychoanalysis and also this idea of having done a lot of yoga over the past and healing through yoga. I mean, my, I, my wife was my teacher before she became my wife. And I, was, uh, I got into yoga and the kind of yoga she's teaching is what's called like ashram style hatha yoga. It's, and she's teaching this when I'm getting into it, like in the middle of very athletic movement style yogas that promote dissociation, I think in some ways, I mean, they get you high, but you're not like, it's not about moment to moment embodiment. Um, So helping people just notice through yoga practices, through being able to do breathing practices breathing practice for two or three minutes and see where they get. So I think having those skills and also most of my work is in the context of psychotherapy. So, and the psychotherapy I do is working with people for multiple years often. So, and 
um, through the process, like having been a patient in, I mean, my therapist saved my life. Um, and I worked with him for 12 years, three times a week. And through the consistency of that, through like being regulated by him and by being regulated by him, learning to regulate and name the experiences I was having was incredibly helpful. Um, there's this really brilliant story. There's a famous psychoanalyst um, who presents this. His name is James Fasagi. And he's worked with this woman for 10 years. And as they're wrapping up treatment, and she had started out being very fragmented, dissociated, parasuicidal all the time. And through the analysis over many years, found herself, found her body, found her being and was able to be in the world in a much safer, more productive way. And she says, he says to her, out of his ego, he says, um, what did I say that was really important to you? Like, what about our work was incredibly important to you? Were there any insights? Were there any interpretations that really landed that changed things for you? And her answer is like perfect and tells this whole story. Jim, I don't remember one thing you said. All I remember is the lilt of your voice. Mm. So, so what it was for her was him telling her bedtime stories. And it wasn't about language. And it wasn't about, it was heart to heart. It was barely, I mean, it, the mind is part of it because the mind is creating, it's like helping to, make sense of the narrative. But I think there's so much about this stuff that we really don't know, but it's about heart sinking. It's about tools. And I think, so this is kind of cool. Um, I did this, this, this program called the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And he does this exercise. This guy, Joshua Rosenthal is quite a brilliant teacher. He does this exercise where he has people bring in their favorite supplements. Their supplement that like they can't live without. <laughs> and so he, and it's a huge thing, like thousands of people there. And he has a, people come up on stage and he has them say why they love their supplements. What this supplement is, whatever it is, like rhodiola, tryptophan, like, you know, whatever it is. And then <laughs> he opens them up and he dumps them in the garbage. Like, and these people like have a big reaction. And he says, and he goes through this whole process with them. And he says at the end of it, he says, there's only one important supplement. There's only one important vitamin and it's vitamin L. And everyone's like, I don't know. I haven't heard that. I'm writing it down. And he says, the only thing in the end that's important is love. And there's another story where my wife works for this integrative doctor, Dean Ornish. And there's a story and he has this, he's really one of the first integrated docs that's healing people from heart disease without drugs and surgery, using a very simple lifestyle program. And this very simple lifestyle program involves yoga, easy movement, diet, and then sharing your feelings. And so this yoga program, this program that he's developed comes right out of living in an ashram with a yoga guru. And so they take, they take community living and then they bring it into people who are totally dissociated from their bodies, dissociated, that aren't in community, that don't know how to feed themselves. And so he tells the story. He's invited by the U.S. military. Of course, lots of problems with heart disease in the military, lots of stress. And he's invited to address I think a thousand four-star generals or something or, or, or generals. And they say, you can speak whatever you want, speak on whatever you want to these generals, these people that run the military. And he spends an hour talking about love, the power of love to heal. And that love is really ultimately what it's about. And I think the interesting thing is like we all, in functional medicine, in trauma work, we, we're, our minds are so seduced by the latest and greatest tool. 
polyvagal theory of somatic experiencing for therapy people, mycotoxins, heavy metals, stealth infections, wh whatever the latest, that if you master this, then you're going to be able to help people. And I think the thing we forget is that if you're not present with people, if people don't feel safe with you, then they, it's impossible for them to heal. Yeah. And the thing I've learned lately, which you probably know about, which to me is the most interesting idea is this idea of the cell danger response. I think you may have written about it. Um, to me, like the cell danger response that the mitochondria that we've known that these are the powerhouse of the cells involved with, you know, lots of mental health conditions, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, this sort of thing. But that the mitochondria can be in one of two modes. It can be in energy producing mode, which is good, which we want. Or it can be in danger sensing. And so if you're under stress, and stress could be trauma from childhood, biases, it could be heavy metals, it could be bacterial overgrowth, it could be anything, it could be physiological stress. Um, your mitochondria shift into defense mode. And no amount of supplements, nothing. This is, this is the bridge. This is the bridge between the psychology and the physiology. If someone's in the cell danger, having a cell danger response, means cells are shut down, we're not healing. Yeah. And if we're not, and, but, and the only thing, I mean, the only thing that can get you out of that state is stress reduction. And stress reduction might be, and that's the, the magic is, what is the, the thing that we need? We need to not make the assumption that stress is psychological. It may very well be. It probably is in part. But the, the idea is teasing out what, what is this stressful thing that's causing the body to shut down, that's causing the, poly, the body to go into a dorsal response in polyvagal theory, you know, or fight flight, like what is that? And that's what functional med in some ways, it's the curiosity, not only the cure, it's the curiosity and the intelligence and like be the openness, like, but to have a model to think through what's in front of you. If someone is, if some, someone has something physiological going on and they go see, and they're presenting with mental health symptoms, and they go see a therapist and they're doing whatever the therapy is might be helpful, but it's not going to give you total, like a total solution here. Yeah. Right. Totally. And if you go see, if you go see a functional medicine person and they do all of this very expensive elaborate testing and they find 20 things that are wrong and they throw 85 supplements at you, like, and the person is stuck in cell danger response because a ch their childhood trauma loops are like keeping them stuck, that person won't get better in a way. Yeah. I think that's the real beauty and, and complexity of really good integrative mental health therapy, you know, is just being able to identify what it is that's dysregulating the system, that's making the system out of balance, you know, it, and you become a medical detective and whether it's childhood right. trauma or whether it's mold or whether it's a heavy metal or whether it's just chronic ongoing stress, you know, whatever it is that's putting your system out of homeostasis, out of balance. And because, you know, mm -hmm. our bodies are incredibly good at healing. And I think what you were saying, I mean, there's so many things that I want to respond to because you've said so many rich things, but, you know, you talk about the relationship with the therapist. And what, if you go back to polyvagal theory, like social engagement, which is the ventral right. vagal system, is so important in terms of managing stress. And it's the time when we rest and digest and, you know, when we're in this ventral vagal state and social engagement. So the relationship with your loved ones, but also with your therapist is really important. But, you know, it's always tricky because you have to deal with the sort of all the 360 degree things that are impacting the, this lack of balance in your system. The other thing I wanted to ask you in terms of therapy, 
because you know there's a huge movement now away from uh, or more towards somatic therapies so you know the fact that we store stress and trauma and and memories in our body and our cellular memories and that actually cognitive therapies are less talking therapies are less effective at going mm. to the root of these these issues now it's very interesting because you've done psychoanalytical work but you, which is very cognitive but you've also done somatic work do you find and and the interesting thing is that you know a lot of clinical guidelines especially in the UK advocate CBT cognitive behavioral therapy as mm. being sort of you know the be all and end all in terms of therapies but we know that cognitive therapies aren't always that effective when it comes to chronic stress trauma etc so what's your view on that because you know do you think that just the relationship with a therapist, even if it's based on talking, is enough? Or do you find that these somatic therapies are more effective? So I think that somatic therapies are definitely the future for sure. And I think that um, talking therapies, specifically therapies that just focus on cognitions, are going to be in 20 years, we won't be talking about CBT. Mm. We may be talking about an integrative new therapy that combines. So the bridge, the bridge from CBT to um, truly somatic therapies is dialectical behavior therapy. So dialectical behavior therapy, uh, a therapy designed for, uh, for borderline personality disorder, takes elements of mindfulness, takes elements of embodiment and um, Buddhism and sort of creates um, a skills-based approach to deal with some dysregulation. But I don't think that therapy probably goes far enough. Um, and I think there's gonna be that finding the body is what therapy has needed for a long time. Finding, and not even the body, finding the nervous system and understanding how to understand maps of the nervous system. And so, and there are different maps, polyvagal theory, focusing on the polyvagal nerve is one well-known map at this point. But the interesting thing is, um, if you look at different, if you look at yoga, let's say, they've been talking about maps of the body connected to maps of the mind, for 5,000 years. So again, it's rediscovering the old. Like, so there's this idea in yoga of the, of the five different bodies, which are called the five different koshas. And you make your way through the physical body and then the energy body and so on and so on until you get to your true self. So these are maps, in some ways, these are maps of how do we move through suffering? How do we move through places of where we're stuck? So I do think that the future is definitely, so there's, there's a 30 year old therapy called Phoenix Rising that combines somatics with yoga um, and assuming particular yoga postures and being embodied in them and really listening to the shifting movements within your body. Um, but yeah, there's no doubt to me that the nervous system, that unless the nervous system is regulated, no one's mind can be regulated. And I don't know if the end of it, it's going to be, I don't know if we're at the, my sense is probably we're very much at the beginning of nervous system regulation tools. And I think we're much, and many of these tools, like polyvagal theory is what, like 30 or 40 years old, probably. And it's really interesting to me being in the field. And it's only within the last 10 years that, that there's widespread interest in, in polyvagal theory. And now everyone wants to study polyvagal theory or somatic experiencing. It's the rare, that's like very much the future. 
Yeah. yeah, I think I think you're right. And what's really interesting about the whole nervous system is that if you look at it from a functional medicine approach, we always think of things that dysregulate our nervous system as being psychological mainly. But I think you pointed out very well that some of them could yeah. be biochemical. So you could have had a very happy childhood and everything's right. fine, but then you're in a very moldy house for a long time. And then your body perceives that mold, those mycotoxins as stressors, you know, right. and they, they are quite traumatic and they create inflammation in your various organs mm -hmm. and your pituitary, et cetera. Um, and heavy metals, the same. Now, there's also a theory, though, that if your nervous system is well regulated from the start, you'll be less susceptible to things like toxins and infections. So it's a bit of a vicious circle. Yeah, like that's right. First. I know, for instance, you know, I have all these weird infections like Lyme and Epstein Barr and all these you know, viruses. Now, you know, I probably got those. Those are stressors and they're stressing out my system and my nervous system, but also I equally probably got them because I was susceptible yeah. through stress. Right. If you're right, if your nervous system is not regulated, you don't have a healthy host. Exactly. If your nervous if your nervous system's not regulated, you're your gut flora is going to be off. Exactly. You know? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And so the, the thing is, how do, how do, from a, from a therapist's perspective, how do you create awareness amongst therapists to even have the beginning, the beginning ability to ask questions? Yeah. Might this be, might this be something might this regulation be caused by something other than trauma? Because exactly. I think we're good at doing that workup and thinking about like, what are the ACE scores? What are like the early childhood, the adverse childhood events that, that happened to this person that lead to this? But I think it's pretty rare for someone who's skilled in the psychotherapeutic world to have really any idea of the real impact cellularly like the real impact that that can have on a person Completely. i mean i think we're we're trained to think about stress and and even like globally oh yeah like stress can lead to illness but i don't think like it's such a it's such a high level like way that we think about it that we don't really drop in to understand what that means so when i learned about this this the so danger response i was like that's it. It's right there. Like literally every cell of your body is affected by some kind of stressor. Completely. I mean, and if you're sick and when someone gets sick, they get, they can get sick with everything. Mm -hmm. They're prone to getting the opportunistic infections like Candida and Epstein-Barr. The same people that get Lyme disease or the co-infections also get heavy metals also are, are susceptible to mold. And it can't, that can't be just that they have this bad, that it, they got, it was like the genetic lottery that left them vulnerable to all these things. It has everything to do with susceptibility to stress that leads to weakness in the immune system, weakness in digestion, weakness in the nervous system. Simple. And we as therapists then, for most therapists, it's easier if you don't think about it in some ways. <laughs> I, heard, I heard this great interview um, on, on the Mold Summit with Wendy Myers, who's this great functional medicine doctor specializing in autoimmunity. And she said she started seeing cases of mold in her practice, but she pretended that they weren't there at the beginning. And because it meant if you know it's there, it means you have to learn what to do about it. I mean, this was many years ago. And there's this thing like in us, like we want to feel like we're good at what we do. And the more we let ourselves know, the more we have to sit with uncertainty, mm. the more we have to be willing to say, oh, there's this thing I don't know. Mm. I, in my presentations, there's a, I have a little um, New Yorker cartoon and it says, um, my, my interest in being informed is at odds with my interest in saying same, yeah. like, like, you know, like in this world, it's incredibly complicated and yeah. it's easy. Like I find myself constantly shutting down to new ideas because it means that, oh God, I have to learn that now. 
Sure. And it's both exciting, but it's sort of overwhelming to be aware. And I think the other thing is, as a practitioner, to know your limits, yeah. to know your lane. I'm a little ADD and highly interested in things. And so it's quite easy for me to hear about something and then go want to go learn it and invest $20,000 in something that takes me off course. So one of the things, I'm not sure I'm wise yet, but one of the wise things I've done is I, I've asked my wife to be my, like, my super ego. And so I tell her, I wanna go buy this $25,000 neurofeedback system. Should I do it? And she'll ask me a set of questions like to see, is this part of your dharma? Is this part of your path? Because you can't do everything. Integrative means you rely on other people too. Like you, it, it's not a one, you're not a one man band. Like it's okay to know the best neurofeedback practitioner in town. It's okay, I, I, I'm not a functional medicine doctor. And I grieve over that a little bit, but then it's like, oh, I get to do what I do. And if I see an uber complex, like an uber complex case, it's not my lane. Let them, if I'm giving them a huge gift if I send them to Dr. Neil Nathan, or if I send them to someone like Wendy Myers, like, and that's like so important to know, like what's like, where's your limits? Like what, like what's, what's yours to do in this world? Because we can't do anything. And it's not about you or me. It's not about my ego. Like we're here to, to be the healthiest, like to live in line with our Dharma, to live in line with what we're supposed to do here and like to help others. Completely. And it doesn't help others if you step into things that aren't, that are, aren't yours to do. So the one thing I've learned is to say no to more things and go deeper into a few things. And I figure learning to be a therapist, learning to be a functional medicine practitioner and being a yoga teacher, that's enough for this lifetime because any one of those are 10 lifetimes worth of study. <laughs> like, I so, so I'm gonna be, I'll never be the best of any of those, but I'm gonna be someone who knows enough about, like I'm, like, I'm gonna be like a librarian I know how to help people get where they need to go. So I'll often say to people, when I make a good referral, I've just saved you five years of suffering. Mm -hmm. I've saved you five years of trying to figure out like where to go. And I just want to say about your website, you know, that you've created to help people navigate and educate themselves about how to help themselves is like so important because I think people if there's so much information coming at, at people on Facebook, on social media, and they, you don't know, you don't know who to trust. You don't, you have no idea what you actually need. And to have a guide, like someone, like some way of na a navigational tool, um, first, like a broad-based one, like your, your, uh, is it called Mind360? Is that what it's called? Yeah, Mind360. Yeah, and then uh, and then a um, practitioner that can help you navigate, like how to think. What's infrared saunas, and how is five G affecting me? And do I have you know? Because the symptoms are the symptoms of all these underlying causes are so similar. It's like, oh, I think I have heavy metals. Oh, I, I think I think I have SIBO. No, you know, it's like, and there's a million things to think about. So. And given all this complexity and given, you know, this sort of slightly overwhelming um, realm of possibilities of things that could be dysregulating our nervous system, dysregulating our homeostasis, you know, what in your experience, if you had like one or two go-to therapies that you feel are the most helpful? I don't know if they're in your feedback or EFT or EMDR or. So in my, so in my experiences start with the basics. Okay. So like, I don't think people, I, in my, I, at the beginning, I used to do much more, much more testing and intervention and stuff. And now it's just, let's start with the basics. Let's choose, let's do an eliminate. So I use like a, I typically have people do a diet like the whole 30. Let's do a diet experiment where you eliminate foods that are known to be inflammatory. And then let's do a reintroduction. 
So diet is huge. If I think, if I ask someone, if I see someone that has like, and I think they might have blood sugar issues, tell me about the pattern of your symptoms. How, how, how long after you eat do you have symptoms? And so if someone says to me, um, I have no idea, you say, okay, let's just track that. And they come back the next time and they say after, every time four hours after I eat, I have a panic attack. It's clear to me. Okay, let's eat for blood sugar too. So that's, that's one thing for sure. Let's find some way for you to begin to increase your vagal tone, to increase your embodiment. Here's, here's like five things to think about. Okay, let's be outside and your circadian rhythms. Be outside for some exercise in the morning, like bright sunlight. Turn your, turn your, 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 your um, screens off by nine o'clock. You know, do a yoga nidra practice. So I give people just, and these are just the very, the, to me, these are like, before you do anything else, find yourself, like find yourself. Like, and in my experience, the basics go a long, long way. And then like, if they're frank traumatic things, let's maybe target those with the MDR. So I do MDR and let's focus on like, what happens if we move some of that through? Um, why don't you try tapping like between session? What do you get? And I have people try things on and if they love it, if they don't love it, we try to tweak it a little bit. If they're like, I hate it, I follow them. Like I follow them. How about taking, and I try not to give people, unless we're doing like a big, if we're doing a gut cleanse or liver support, or I try to give people like five supplements. You know, your mood's kind of up and down. Let me give you a little lithium. Let's, let's take, how many times a day can you take a few supplements? How about we find the right dose of 5-HTP? We'll give you a little, little adrenal support. And let's just see how you do. And so, and I'm regulating them and I'm, I'm holding the possibility that a simple solution is going to be helpful. Because I think when people are being exposed to functional medicine approaches, they think they're incredibly complex. They think that their systems are incredibly complex and they need to find the root cause. And I think there's ways in which that's right. And finding the root cause can be a jackpot. And, but I think it also, for some people, can be a rabbit hole. Okay. And the more you focus on the basics, and probably it's also because I, it's the, play, it's the place I feel comfortable is occupying space with people, um, being attuned, and being, and I, I think uh, my wife says I am, and I'm, I'm trying to own this, that I'm more intuitive than I think. And like, just like feeling like what, and that we're not talking about necessarily like moving like a barge 180 degrees. What happens if we move something 20 degrees and notice and see what happens? And so that approach is kind of like, similar to somatics, it's small movements that lead to big outcomes. It's the noticing, it's the reporting back. It's like being in relationship as you do it. Yeah. And the funny thing is people will come to me for psychotherapy and we'll end up doing nutrition. And invariably, um, the people that come to me through my website for nutrition will end up being um, psychotherapy. And I just recently saw someone from Europe um, and clearly a young woman with incredible perfectionism. Stress was like a huge part of it, was trying to get pregnant. Of course, she couldn't. Um, had felt like a failure because she had had to leave one European city to come home. And like we did some nutrition, but the thing that helped was helping her go easy on herself helping her be a friend to herself, which noticing when she was critical, would you talk to your friend that way? Um, my wife always says to me, like, if I'm being mean to myself, be nice to my friend. <laughs> like, so like, be nice. 
But I do think simple things are incredibly powerful yeah. and simple interventions. And, um, and anyone who's interested, this idea, the, Julia Ross's book, there's, there's a lot of really good functional medicine books. I think uh, Dr. Hyman's book is awesome. I forget what it's called. Uh, the um, Mind. So the Ultra, Ultra, Mind. Ultra Mind. And it's, very, it's pretty functional medicine focused. And Julia Ross comes at it not being trained as a functional medicine doctor, but being trained as a, a psychotherapist, starting with very simple solutions. And then that get increasingly more complex if you don't get the results that you need. And in my experience, which sort of matches her, she says 80% of people get better with diet, with targeted supplements, with some um, embodiment kind of work, I would add that part, um, with encouraging people to do movement. Um, and then when that doesn't work, you move into look, digging deeper. So there's no point in like, you know, you, there's like, if you're doing archaeology, there's no point in digging the whole thing up. You're going to miss a lot of opportunities. You go layer by layer by layer. And I, m in my experience, starting with the first layer, the simple stuff gives people one, it's very easy to do. It doesn't cost a lot. It doesn't cost a lot for people to understand their blood sugar, to get some targeted supplements like glutamine. That doesn't cost a lot. And like it, and it doesn't take a long time. So I'll usually say, I'm, we're probably going to work for like three months or four months together if it's a nutritional focused thing. And I'm only going to keep you as long as it's going to be helpful. Um, so, so I'm, I'm simple in a way. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's deceivingly, it's deceivingly simple probably, but it, the low hanging fruit tends to be the usual suspects. Cause I think there are usual kind of, there's very common patterns that you see. And the more you do, the more you see the common patterns. Um, but of course, sometimes it is lying and the common patterns aren't going to fix that. Or sometimes it is, but it, but if you, if you build up people's resiliency, those things aren't going to be nearly as bad. If you turn, if you do interventions to turn off the self danger response, people are going to be more resilient and adaptable. I think that's key: is building people's resilience. I think that's you know so important. And just one final question yeah. is: How do you work with turning off the self danger response? Do you have a technique to do that? That's effective. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think there's, I think all of these techniques and finding because it's it's. The question is, how do you turn down stress? Yeah. So the first thing is identifying. The first thing, I think the first thing is, what are the stressors? So I think if you have a way of thinking about stress, so there are some, you know, I think a good, um, doing a good clinical interview sort of gives you the information to start thinking about what direction are we going to go here? What are, what's the most likely cause? Yeah. Because, Clearly, it's, it's never one thing, as you said. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's Epstein-Barr, and it's a dysregulated nervous system from misattuned parenting, and it's your, a difficult relationship, it's divorce, it's, it's a million things. And the question is, what are the most potent contributors to it? Yeah. And how do you go from there? And so the question is, do you start broadly? So some functional medicine doctors will do $5,000 for the testing, which I think is a fair place to start. Um, it's not typically where I would start. I would start with giving self-regulating tools. I would start with knowing, like having the top 10 list of things that tend to help people feel more empowered and supported. Yeah. Um, and being in nature, yeah. having downtime. You know, like, what do you do for fun? Like, what's the last time you laughed? Like... Let me, let's give some, let's, let's get some basic blood work and look at it functionally. Like let's run it through a functional program just to even or an organic acid test. Those are, te those are two things, not to, and the, the blood work, especially cheap because they can get it 50 bucks and like and run through a program that's going to give you, that's a nice thing to do because it then gives you, okay, the, 
there's definitely infection here, or it looks like there might be thyroid, or I think it might be a, the thyroid problems related to adrenal problems. And like, if you know how to interpret or hear mineral analysis, like some broad analysis that just gives you a way to think about, okay, because you need a game plan. It's hard to win the game if you don't have a plan. And I think often we don't have plans, but how do you sort of think, what do we do first? What do we do second? What do we do third? How much can this person digest? How much can this person handle? Because if you, you know, like there's certain, I've, I've seen patients that have been to different people and they leave without any understanding of what they're doing. And then it's like sort of, it, it's like an allopathic model, like they're taking the right supplements, but they don't really get it. And I think so much of it is having the patients align their spirit with the tools. Yeah. Like the tool, the tools aren't going to work in le- like the most important thing is the is placebo. We think of placebo being bad. Placebo is placebo can cure anything. It's much more powerful than any medicine, any supplement. If the person believes they're going to get better, they're going to get better likely because it's going to, 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 um, to activate their healing response. It's going to put them out of defense, cell danger, into healing, rest and digest. Completely. And that's yeah. the key. And I mean, once you're in rest and digest, then your body can do the rest. I mean, you know, your body is very good at healing. Yeah. And, the, and your body is the best doctor there is. So if you can take the, the, the impediments out and some are frank impediments and some is the, some is the dysregulation, then people are going to heal because bodies do that. That's what they're supposed to do. Exactly. Yes. Well, Josh Friedman, Dr. Friedman. This is great. It's been so <laughs> lovely to talk to you and your patients are so lucky to have you with your wide toolkit and your wonderful wisdom. So thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was fantastic and very envious of people who get to actually work with you. And I will put all your uh, resources in the show notes. Um, But just very quickly, what is your website for those who are listening? Mood, M-O-O-D, healing.com. Moodhealing.com. So that's Dr. Josh Friedman. Josh, thank thank you so so much for your time. Have a lovely day. Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you, your loved ones, or clients may take to start their healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with our latest interviews on integrative mental health. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement programs.